For those of you I yet to have the pleasure of meeting, my name is Pamela Kembertong. I'm the head of arts and learning here at Asia House. It's such a pleasure to have all of you with us tonight, mm. distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and our arts members. Thank you all so much for being here and joining us. We're incredibly thrilled to have Professor Hamid Noeed um, with us here from the United States and to share his vast knowledge and insights into the subject of this evening's talk, Afghan Lapis Lazuli and the Shrines of Power. After his talk, he'll be in conversation briefly with Seema Vasari. Um, and before we open to questions, I want to say a few words. Seema is a wonderful award-winning jeweler whose works have been recognized by the British Museum, for whom she's created several commercial jewelry collections, and who has brought along kindly tonight some stunning pieces in the next room, which I hope, if you haven't seen them already, you'll be able to uh, look at them afterwards. Um, and I first contacted Hamid following an article I read in the Huffington Post a while ago entitled, Afghanistan's Beautiful Link to Da Vinci's 450 million Salvatore Mundi. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> Which of course many of you in the room know about. But I was so intrigued when I read that you first mentioned the use of ultramarine as a pigment, which actually goes back to the 6th and 17th centuries uh, BC, on the walls of caves, uh, temple caves in uh, Afghanistan. And so I, I was immediately like drawn to reach out to you. I, I don't, if you remember, I first emailed you saying, can you possibly come to London, please, when you're next here? And if you can share this topic with our members and also interested public. And I'm so delighted that you're here, I can't tell you. <laughs> Just a little bit of background. Hamid um, has received his MFA from the State University of New York at Buffalo. He was also professor of art history, color theory, studio arts, and art appreciation at the Fine Arts Department of Kabul University. He's now an honorary member of the High Council of Arts and the Center for Contemporary Arts in Afghanistan. Hamid Nawid is also an active member of the Alliance for the Restoration of Cultural Heritage, based in Washington, DC. And as a Fulbright scholar, he's conducted many researches, uh, sorry, research studies, I should say, in the fields of arts and humanities. Um, and he's also authored a number of scholarly essays on the arts and cultures of Afghanistan and the region, and has given talks on the same topics at George Washington University, George Mason University, American University, Columbia, and the Historical Society of Williamsburg, it's not far from where my sister used to live. Um, he's recently um, been on a book tour, so we're delighted that he's come from the US to London, uh, on his um, two volumes now, Art Through the Ages in Afghanistan. And we do actually have a few of the books available in the other room after the talk, along with a guest book. So we do hope you'll take the time to, um, to sign that. Um, Hamid will be speaking for approximately 45, 50 minutes, followed by a brief response with Seema and have some questions. And then we'll have a reception in the other room, which we hope you'll stay to join us. So please join me in giving much a warm welcome to Professor Hamid Nawi. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm so happy to see everyone here. I'm very delighted. Uh, I thank Pamela to invite me to come from the United States of America to talk about the ancient civilization which emerged from the land which is called Afghanistan, and Lapas Lazuli is one of its products. Not very people are familiar with Afghanistan ancient history, unfortunately, because most of the scholars of 19th century were either stationed in India or in Persia. So they thought it is a continuation of those two civilizations. But actually, if we look thoroughly, then we see that this place which is called Afghanistan today was cradle of many civilizations. From very early ages, during uh, the medieval time, and then during the Islamic time and contemporary. Lots of poets emerged from this land, lots of thinkers emerged from this land, and many schools of arts were created there. Uh, so, 
if we do not use the generic terms that the scholars of 19th century usually used, then we can see that there are so many different styles of art in that part of the world. Not only Persian art, not only Indian art, not only Afghan art. There were so many artists who emerged with so many innovative thoughts. Well, anyway, uh, I wrote, uh, I, I read this article about uh, the painting called Salvatore Mundi, the Savior, which was painted by Leonardo da Vinci and in Europe during the High Renaissance, and it was sold in a very high price in an auction in New York. Uh, and somebody pointed out that to me, and the usage of the ultramarine blue in that painting make, made the painting very exuberant and made the colors to last. So the paint, the paint pigment ultramarine comes from the powder of lapis lazuli. And lapis lazuli is a stone, a precious stone, which is uh, found from very high mountains of Afghanistan in the northeast, the Badakhshan province. So I'm getting familiar with this laptop now. So uh, I'm going to the next slide. See, one of the beauties of lapis lazuli is that it comes in variety of blues, different hues of blues, from very dark blue to very light blue. And that's why it can give you a variation of color. And that gives lots of freedom for the artist to use it in, in, in different settings of art. And the use of the stone itself uh, was very ancient. As we see, these are called, these mountain ranges in Avesta and also in Rig Veda, very ancient, very ancient text. It's called as the mountains of Harabarzati. Harabarzati means where, it's a very high mountain where the gods dwelt, where the gods lived, and then the waters came down from it and then created rivers. And that's in Northeast Afghanistan. Now we call it Hindu Kush Mountain. It's Southern Hindu Kush Mountain, Northern Hindu Kush Mountain. And it, it housed lots of minerals. According to some Avestan texts, Mitra, the sun, the god of sun, and Sura, or Surya, in, 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 in the Vedic text, lived on top of this mountain. And every morning with this golden chariot was coming down to bring prosperity and love to the earth and then illuminate the darkness of evil. That was the ancient beliefs. And that's, that area is called Sarasang and Badakhshan. That's where all the lapis lazuli big mines are located. As far as the evidence show, from the time of the pharaohs all the way to the kingdoms of Sumerians in Mesopotamia, or the, king, the kingdoms of Akkadians, Ashurians, they all used the ancient Babylonians, they use this stone. And we have evidence of that. Okay, now these statues are Bactrian statues made from lapis lazuli in second millennium BC during the Bronze Age or earlier. Uh, this area between Balkh and Mar is called the uh, Bactrian Mar 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 Margiana um, archaeological zone. It's a big zone. And most of these statuettes came from that area. 
It was uh, first discovered by Viktor Siryanadi, the Russian archaeologist, in the 1970s, and then later on, it was added to more and more statues that came from that area. In northern Afghanistan, it goes from Balkh all the way to Mar, it's called Bamak. Uh, but uh, it's the archaeological term, you don't have to worry about it. But this was the area of these most stuff. It showed that it had a very ancient civilization. There are composite statues. Some of them were made from lapis lazuli. And they were all three-dimensional. They were not relief statues. And that was uh, one of the beauties of those statues. And uh, that shows that at that time, there was some trade between Balkh, Bakshia, Bukhdi, Balhika, which is written in, in Rig Veda and Mesopotamia. So these uh, composite statues we can see also in, in, in Sumerian art. But these are made from lapis lazuli, but better proportions. And the colorful mountains and rocks of Afghanistan throughout the ages provided inspiration for the artists, as well as it housed lots of minerals, precious stones, like lapis, emerald, ruby, amethyst, and all that. And we can see in the crystals of Lagman, which is uh, in the southern Indukush, the amazing, um, beautiful pieces. In Nuristan and Lagman, we have all these we call it Balao. It is the most beautiful shiny stone you can see, very transparent. The one on the right is one of them. The one on the left is the emerald, which is from Panjshir. And then, uh, of course, the ruby and uh, sapphire. And all these stones were found in Afghanistan mountain. It's a wealth that God gave to us, but we have not been able to utilize it fully because of unfortunate situations which governed in, in our country during the last four decades of war and lots of human greeds are there. And I hope these uh, minds are still intact. And then at the very right bottom, you see the gold, the gold uh, that's found from Afghanistan. There are four zones in our country that has gold. Is the river of Kokcha bring lots of gold. Then we have in Baghlan province, and also in, in the mountains north of Kabul, and Ghazni, Zarkashan, is the biggest um, gold mine. Uh, but uh, it gets smuggled a lot. And that gave the people of our country from very long time until now, uh, the opportunity or the ability to create things from gold. The very, oh, I'm just learning this thing. Oh, good. <laughs> this one is from Baghlan, Tape Fulul, third millennium BCE. Th these were found from Baghlan. It, it, it is a very ancient, ancient vessel. And uh, it has all these uh, pictures of oxes. And also it has some geometric design. It was very badly damaged, but it's a very ancient piece. The one here is a chariot, which is housed right now in British Museum, I think Victoria Albert Museum. It was found by some merchants that were coming from Bukhara in Balkh towards Kabul. And then from Kabul, they were going to sell it in Rawalpindi for the British people. And then on the way, the bandits attacked the caravan of the merchants. And there was a gentleman, a British gentleman, his name was Captain Barton. And he saved it and brought it to, to British Museum from the bandits. 
Mm, yes. Well, uh, this thing is uh, labeled as a hominid art, a Kamenids, you know, the Persians, uh, uh, in British Museum, but was not found through an official excavation. So that's why it's just an assumption. However, it reminds of, of the a Western text and also a Rigvedian text which talks about golden horses which brings the chariot of the sun and then illuminates the world. The sonnet 117 of, of Rig Veda talks about this uh, chariot and it was uh, uh, written, it was said by a princess of Oxus called Gahucha. Rolf Griffith translated that in 19th century. And uh, it, it, it is written later in Sanskrit languages. And then also in a Western text, which just came around after Rig Veda, uh, it talks about the four horses which represented uh, the chariot, which represent one of them was like thunder, sleet, snow, and rain. They brought it, this prosperity to the lands on, on the command of the sun. They were golden horses with shiny hoofs. And, and this is very good. And then you see the two men which are sitting on, on the chariot they're part of a ceremony that the Zrossians had at the ancient time that they were throwing the, the wine of Suma, was a sacred wine, uh, on, on the fire to have this uh, sacred fire. And lots of stories about it. I'm not going to take so much of your time on this thing. But they're a very peaceful men. They're different than the chariots of Egyptians, Assyrians, and also Achaemenid kings who were coming with the weapons and, and fighting. They are beautiful too, nice artwork, but most of them are relief statues carved on the stones. And the one here is also very important, this one. It's the biggest kind of Alexander the Great after he uh, invaded India, conquered India actually, fought with the King Poros and then uh, killed the elephant and then he was victorious. So he made a helmet for himself. Oh, sorry. Uh, he, yeah, here. He, he made a helmet like elephant head and that's an Indian elephant. Uh, it is, uh, was studied by the most uh, famous uh, uh, scholar of the ancient coins, Peparachi. And then he, this one is found from southern Afghanistan, Mirzaka, in, in Paktia province. So we see that the culture of, of dealing with gold and precious jewelries existed from Oxus all the way to southern Afghanistan. And then the one, oops, I have to learn that better. Okay, this red one. This is also from Mirzaka, southern Afghanistan. It's King Azilis II, the second, the Sakas king, the India, Hindu Sakas king, you know, who ruled all the way from Kandahar to Indus Valley in, in, in the first century AD. Actually, it's so interesting, if I take one minute, please, about this thing. Oh, this is a place in, in, in Paktia, it's called Kofar Kult, uh, Kofar Castle, the castle of infidels. And then these ladies uh, were uh, next to the stream and they saw these golds are coming. Then the archaeologists went and they found this big, huge pool that 
the old kings were throwing their jewelry, their valuables as, as a contribution for a shrine which existed in ancient time, all the way from 500 BC to first and second century AD. It was full of gold. Unfortunately, during the wars, in 1992, it was looted. It was about 700 pieces uh, of gold and valuables, copper, and all these very ancient things were sold by smugglers, Afghans and foreigners, in the streets of Peshawar. And uh, we have very few of that left in the Kabul Museum. I don't know which one are left and not. The other ones that you see in the lower, lower row, right here, are from Telatapa, Telatapa Shibergan, in, in, in the Jauzijan province of Afghanistan in the north. And it was a, sh a graveyard of, of these ancient Sakas and Yushi kings. And then all, all of them came from six graves and five of them belonged to the ladies, one of them to a man, because the ladies collected more gold than the guys. And um, it's one of the most, most precious uh, hoard or collection of gold which exists after the uh, Egyptian pharaohs. It's the second largest one. It's about 35,000 pieces. And uh, these, these ones, all of them tells a story. Not, it's not just a piece of jewelry. I don't want to waste your time uh, talking about each piece of jewelry, but that existed. During this time, this land was called the land of running waters because of all these streams were coming. See how many rivers were coming from these mountains? of Parapamizad, I mean, there was like the skeleton of Afghanistan, Parapamizus in, in Greek, Parapamizad in a Western text, it means someplace which is higher than where the eagles can fly. And then all these mountains connected this land. It created a, a cultural zone, which was later called Ariana. At that time, we don't know what they called it, because we know, according to a Western text in Rig Veda, it was called Aryavarta Aryana Vija. And then in Pahlavi, Ishkani is called Iranu Vij. And it was the center of it, according to Yasht. And we saw there are 16 sacred cities and then out of these 16 cities, 12 of them are in Afghanistan. It, it starts from Indus Valley, goes all the way to Caspian, southern uh, banks of Cas Caspian. It goes as far as Gurgaon in Persia. And then it goes as far as Gandahara in, uh, in, in, in Indus Valley. So Afghanistan was located in the heart of this cultural zone, which was called once Ariana, according to Herodotus and, uh, and Polybus, and a mention in Strabo's Geographica in the first century. And there was another gentleman, Greek gentleman, his name was Aracistinus, who draw, who drew the map of that area. I didn't want to put all that. Now, this is a very interesting map. It shows how the trade of that time went. See, whoops. I, I have to get more training on this thing. It goes back. No, no, this way it goes back. Okay, okay, all right. Oh, I got it. Yeah. 
See, there's, we have China here, and then we have uh, Sogdiana, which is from Saxonia, which is Tajikistan today, you know? Then these are the mountains of Harabarzati. Then we have Bokhdi, Balhika, Balkh. The, the lapis came from Sarasang to Balkh. It made its way to Arya or Herat, and then went to Mar. Okay, that was one road. The other road came down to Bamikan, Bamiyan, went to Arakosia, Kandahar, and went to Drangiana, Zaranj, and then there is a city here called Shahr Sohta, and the border of Iran and Afghanistan. And uh, that city, we found some lapis lazuli, and from there, it went to Anshan and went to Susa, 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 Shush, Shahri Shush, which is in Iran today. And it was uh, during the Islamic kingdoms, which were before the Ahamani Shids. They, they were like, they, they shared the same culture with Sumerians. And that's why their art pieces are so close to each other. Most of them are like relief statues of men with, with beard, you know, winged, cam uh, winged uh, oxes and with the head of a man, very imaginary art. And it was like the same art that you can see in Babylon, in city of, or in Ashurian art. And, and that was, see, what happens, there are two mountain, major mountain ranges in this part of Asia. One's called the Zagros Mountains. And all the civilization of Zagros Mountain is right here. And then it goes to Persian Plateau. And then most of the cities of ancient Persia are today, Iran today, was built around this city, Zagros Mountains. Because it was a more, uh, and then because there were two major rivers there, you know? The, ma the major rivers were like Tigris and, uh, and, and the other river, Dajla. What's Dajla in English? Ephrates, because of that one. And, and most of the civilization we saw in Farsapolis, Shush, and all that is right in this area. In between, around 60 degree latitude, we have the big deserts. That's why there are not so many civilization emerged here. We have the salt desert, desert of Lut, and Kermania desert. And then in the south, we have more, more civilization here because it was next to the Persian Gulf. In Afghanistan, we had this area. All rivers, because there were lots of rivers. And rivers provided lots of opportunity for people to live. It also created natural roads for the traders because the Rivers cut through the mountains, cut through the mountains, create gorges. It provides food. It provides water for agriculture. It, it is animals come and live around, live around there. So it was, uh, became a fertile land at that time. And that's why it was getting invaded all the time because they needed food for, um, for their soldiers to go fight the Achaemenids. They, they were fighting with the Greeks, so they needed soldiers, they needed food for their soldiers, they needed meat, so they were coming and fighting. And that's a very long time. And however, from the Shush, it went to the Sumer, Sumerian land, a very ancient land, in the city of Ur. Most of the lapis lazuli is found in the city of Ur, especially in the royal cemetery of Ur. And we see very beautiful artwork there. Okay, okay. All right. How do we know? Do we have any evidence 
that this road existed or we are just making it up. We know that this road existed because of the excavations which were made in Afghanistan in 1959 and also in 1976, first by the French archaeologists and second by the American archaeologists. Louis Dupree was uh, digging in a hole at, at a cave in the mountain called Shamshirgar and found this seal what made from uh, bone. And then we see a Bactrian camel, Bactrian camel with wing. That shows that they were, these traders were coming from Bactria to Kandahar. And then it had wings because it shows the influence of Sumerian art there. This road was going from Kandahar all the way to Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro in Indus Valley. So at that time, very long time, uh, we didn't know that uh, they had so much trade, but they had lots of trade. All the way from Mesopotamia to Indus Valley. That's why they call it the Indus-Sumerian civilization between Indus Valley and, and also between um, Indus Valley, there was city of Mohenjo-Daro, which was very advanced. We saw lots of evidence of art and culture and life there. And it was also a city in Kandahar. If, if you get bored, please tell me, because I get carried away on this subject sometimes. <laughs> but it is very important, you know, because this was like the connecting point. Obviously, those days people didn't have these GPS and stuff to find their way, so they were following the rivers. So rivers were very important. So that's why Afghanistan White became the crossroad of trade in, in Asia because it had lots of rivers. And all these roads were along the rivers so they could find their way, the merchants. You know, they, they came from India to Kabul, from Kabul to Parwan, Bamiyan. Then they went up uh, to Bar from Bar to uh, Central Asia, Transoxania, and the same way from all the way from China, they went in along the rivers because the rivers could provide water for the animals. And then they came to Durangiana from they went all the way to Egypt. So that was a very fun time. And then on the back of the seal, we have this falcon. Falcon. Falcon was the symbol of kingdom in ancient Ariana. And this picture, it was uh, from the National Gallery of Art in Afghanistan, painted by Professor Burishna, one of the most celebrated artists of Afghanistan, who wrote, uh, who painted this story uh, on, on a, inspired by a very ancient fable that there was this king called Kuakwata Kaikobot. And then the descendants were Kaikobot, Kaikaus, and all that. He, he was a farmer. And then the, the two falcons crowned him to become a king. And Kai means wisdom. So he became wise. And that's why. And all these... Uh, Kings, they had, they called themselves Aspagan, the horsemen, the horsemen. Their kings were called Vishtas, Gishtas, Lahras, Zaras, Burasp, Aspa, Aspagan. Then it's all written in Prak Prakrit and Sanskrit uh, texts. And these people came all the way from Bach to Kabul, from Bach from Kabul to India. They were called Aspagana, Advagana, which is Afghans. Afghan does not mean any tribe. Afghan means the cavaliers, because they had the very good horses. There were two good breeds of horses at that time, the Arabian horses, which were very fast and elegant, and then the Afghan horses, because they were very sturdy and strong and 
and they were very good for fighting. And if you had a good horse, then you were a powerful man. That's why these kings were giving this title as, as their horses. Gishtas, Vishtas means someone with a very smart horse. Zaras, a king with 1,000 horse. Lahras, a king with, with, with a beautiful horse. Gold, Buras, a king with golden horse. So Aspagan, then the S went away, it became Afghan. And Afghan, according to Arabic uh, alphabet, became Afghan. So it does not represent any tribe. It's, it's not a tribal name. Because, that, because Pashtun is a different structure of the word. It does not correspond with Afghan. Pashtuns, Pakhtas, Pashtuns, Pakhtians, they all start with P. Afghan does not. Well, that's the way this ancient name existed and later on became the name of Afghanistan. And also Aryan, Aryana, does not mean a race. Ara means farmer. Aran means somebody who does good farming. According to Max Müller, who studied uh, the ancient languages of that era, in his book he writes, Ara, Aran means farmers. So they were not a superior race. They were not the most beautiful race. Nothing to do with their feature, with their physical appearance. They were Aran. Arans mean farmers. And why they were praised? Because they did not fight over the food. They provided food for everyone. That's why they were called noblemen, because they provided food. And then Kwakwata, he was a farmer too. Aran. And, and then that's why most of the cities in Afghanistan starts with Ara. Ara Ya Herat. Ara Kozia Kandahar. Ara Ghistan. Ara Zagan. It's all Ara. means places that farmers lived and provided food. So, but in 19th century, it was so many different theories developed in Europe, and especially at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Then they were saying, Aryans are the higher race, Aryans are this, Aryans are better race. No. We will be condemned in the history if we say one race is better than the other race. We're all human beings doing different things. Well, anyway. Okay, this way. All right, now, back, back to lapis lazuli. I'm not gonna go sideways anymore. <laughs> and this uh, British uh, scholar, British, um, um, very famous archeologist, he found this, uh, his name was uh, Mr. Wool Woolley, Woolley, yeah? He found the stand of, of, of Ur in, in the city of Ur, in ancient Sumer. And then that's why yeah, when he looked at the box, he, he was looking for a different thing, but now we know that there are lots of lapis lazuli um, used as a mosaic background in the city. This box is the stand of, of uh, called stand of, of, of Ur. It shows the peace and war scene in both sides. And then uh, it shows that it was maybe after a, t a war, there was a triumph, and then they had a festive occasion, and that's why they have all these animals going. And it's all lapis lazuli. And then uh, a king called Or Publisad, and uh, he had but I think he's a legendary king. Nina Karak was his, uh, a, a lady who associated with this king, had healing power. And why they were thinking that lapis lazuli is so sacred to be used in royal um, tombs, in royal um, 
boxes and royal instruments because if we see in this slide, we will find out. Like on top, we see the two pictures of galaxy with all the stars, with all the deepness of blue color that we see in the skies, in the heavens. And you look at the lapis lazuli, it's just another representation of, the in, of all these skies and galaxies on a piece of stone. All the stars you can see, all the movements of the clouds you can see. So maybe the ancient people thought it's a, not, an, a symbol of heavens on earth. It's, it's another sky, so they can have it on a ring in their hand. So it, it is something so sacred. So maybe it has some healing power. So that's why they used it in, 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 in very different um, things which were uh, precious to them, like, like the lair or the harp of queen, which is found also from the city of Ur and also at the gate of Ishtar in Babylon lots of lapis lazuli is used. Most of these gates are not there. Ishtar, like Anahita, was like the symbol of fertility, the this, this symbol of kindness, the symbol of a mother uh, which brought fertility. And then the king, which is called Nabuchadnezzar Nasser, uh, created this to show his, his uh, devotion for the Lady Ashtar. This beautiful, and as, as you can see, great, great amount of lapis lazuli is used in, to create this wall with all the animals which were important to them, which had some meaning for them. And then as we can go further and further towards West we see that in, in a king's statue, which is made from gold, and from a lapis lazuli stone, we see the value of this precious stone which existed at that time according to the belief of the people. Then we have the same falcon of Egypt made from lapis lazuli and also on, in most of the artwork of, of Egypt, great amounts of lapis lazuli is utilized in a very respected way because they thought it's a very sacred stone. You know, one of the thing is that Nile River was, was a very fertile land. Also Mesopotamia was a very fertile land, but they lacked stones, so they had to import it. They, they lacked even iron, so they have to bring it from other places. They lacked copper, so they have to. So they could go far east towards Afghanistan today and bring all these things. So that's very important to note. And then we see, now, until now we were talking about usage of the stone itself. Now, the other aspect of the lapis lazuli is that they created color from it, paint pigment. And this picture we see is from Bamiyan, Bamiyan statue, the statue and on, on the arch, on the, on the arch we see that they use color of lapis lazuli. And it's a fresco painting, you know, it's water-based. And then the powder, uh, the blue was created by the powder of lapis lazuli. And and all the paintings of Buddha, it, it's, 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 it was very commonly used. And along with other colors, but mainly lapis lazuli, because it was found from that region, and also because it was considered a holy paint. It was, it was coming from the mountains of the ancient gods. So they wanted to adorn uh, the Buddhist uh, in the murals with that thing, with that paint, to show their respect for Buddha. Oh. 
And this is one of the cave paintings of, Buddha, of Bamiyan, which used the, the, the lapis color. At that time, they were not calling it ultramarine blue. They were calling it Lajwardi, Lange Lajward. Uh, but in, in Europe, they call it ultramarine blue. We will come to that. And these, uh, uh, these caves are the, like from 4th to 5th century AD, about 1600 years ago, they were painted over the plaster in the caves of Bamiyan, which were like the assembly places of the monks. And then they were like small study rooms for the monks. And Bamiyan was one of the biggest sanctuaries of Buddha in that part of the world. So I'm not going to go over that because it's going to be very different. Uh, I'll get away from the subject. And this, this is very important. It's very important. This is the first oil painting in the world, which was created in Bamiyan. You know, most of the paintings of the frescoes that we see in Chinese art, uh, all the way to Europe, it is water-based. Because the one Eyed Brothers crew discovered oil painting in the 15th century. But this is like 10th century before that, when the Japanese uh, uh, archaeologic team came to Afghanistan, they found this painting and examined it. It's oil base. And that's why the colors are still so exuberant. Because, see, uh, have you, anybody painted Frisco painting here? No? See, when the plaster, you, you paint that over the plaster, and the plaster absorb it, absorbs it. And then you have to work a little bit more because it absorbs it. Then you have to work a little bit more, plaster absorbs it, till it becomes shiny. But when you put oil, it just stays on the surface. And then if, that's why it, it remains to be shinier. Well, anyway, this thing was used in Bamiyan, of course, and then the other is, is crimson red, made from shingriff. Shingriff is, somebody told me in English, cinnabar. It's shingriff in, in, in our language. So it was all coming from these uh, precious stones. The tradition continued all the way to 15th century, 14th century, during the Tamari era, and then many um, beautiful ma manuscripts were, were, were painted with gold, it was called Tasib Kali, illuminated, and also with these beautiful paints which were coming from um, um, precious stones and uh, natural paints which were coming from plants and leaves and all that. And they were like very, um, special formulas that they created these paints and uh, this is the Silk Road started from 2nd century AD from time of Kushanian and also with the Romans when Marcus Aurelius uh, was the Roman Empire, Emperor and he announced Pax Romana the the era of peace in Rome. The, so that's when the trade started. It continued through the ages until 15th century. It became at its peak in 15th century. That's why uh, there were more connection between East and West at that time, between uh, at the, during the time of Renaissance after the Crusade Wars, after the medieval time, the, it was, the Silk Road was at its peak. And all these cities which were on the, uh, on, on, the, on the Silk Road, they became very rich because merchants were coming. And after, after that, 18, 6, 17 and 18 centuries, these cities became poor because of uh, its trade was done by sea. So they, they did not have all these visitors.
But at this time that I'm talking, it was at its peak of affluence. And that's when the same sort of manuscripts that we see in, in, in Asia, in Afghanistan, Persia, India, the same kind of manuscripts also appear in, in, in uh, Europe. It is uh, the Sibius, which was painted by this uh, lady, Hildegard, the German lady who had so much devotion for Christ. And then he did all this. She, she did. Some people say the artist is unknown, but most of people think that they, this was a Renaissance lady. She was uh, a musician. She was uh, a healer. And she was a very fine um, writer. So they used these, um, these illuminated pages, lots of the blue, which they called it ultramarine. Ultramarine means something which came from the other side of the seas. Ultramarine. That's why this blue is called ultramarine blue in the West. It's because it was traveling all the way. And turquoise was coming from the way of Turkey. That's why they call it tur turquoise. The, the name in Farsi in Dari is Firuza. The, in Europe, they call it turquoise because they thought it's coming from Turkey. It was coming from Nishapur at that time. Nishapur who I had was the biggest, like, like Lapis Lazuli was uh, famous, was, was found in Afghanistan. Nishapur was, Firuza was found in Nishapur, the best kind. So they made this uh, turquoise blue and, uh, and uh, ultramarine blue in lots of paintings of Europe, like Welton, of Diptych of Welton in, in England. This is a, a portable altar, altarpiece, and you see the great usage of ultra. Sorry? Oh, I have 10 more. So we go through these paintings faster. All, all these, see, we, I'm showing that they have different uh, shades of, of ultramarine blue used in the altars. Amazing. Oh, my God. Okay, okay. Oh, this painting by Bronzino is beautiful. You can see different shades of, of lapis is called, is used here in painting of one eye, beautiful. It's, it's like lighter. And then also in this uh, uh, arena, uh, the, t the chapel of arena in Italy. So this is very important, arena chapel. I won't talk about this two minutes. <laughs> you all read, read this uh, Divine Comedy, uh, comedy of Dante. In, in that one, he talks about a Venetian uh, merchant who was very charging lots of interest to people, and then he was going to get punished. So his son, Victor, tried to create a basilica, a beautiful shrine which could give it to Mary as a gift so his father's soul will be good in, in the heaven. Um, so at that time, they thought that um, sky is like buildings in, on earth. So it is built from marble and then adorned with gold and it goes to the lapis skies, blue skies. And then in this one, is, is the same formula is created. It goes from earthly scenes to very uh, heavenly scenes. And the same thing in Sistine Chapel, in the wall of the altar, created by Michelangelo. You can see the usage of ultramarine blue a lot here. And then also in this painting of Perugini, uh, Christ giving keys to Peter. You see usage of ultramarine blue in the sky and also in the, in the clothings of the saints and Jesus himself. Now, 
This is very important. This is the one that started the whole thing. This is the painting which is called Salvatore Mandi, the savior of the earth, the savior of the world by, by Leonardo da Vinci, which was sold very expensively. And then this crystal ball somehow represents the world. It is treated so beautifully, transparency in you see. And then Jesus is giving amnesty to people. Yeah, that's amazing that there is a statue of Buddha in Afghanistan, Paitava, north of Kabul, from second century, which gives amnesty. And then his hand is down, showing to the earth. He's giving amnesty to the earth. And if you see, look at the robe. Look, up, look. It goes from left shoulder to the right shoulder, the same way. So somehow, these people were connected in the olden days. I, so this statue in, in Kapisa is very older than this painting about him, but the idea is traveled, you know? And that's why we have the coin of this king in Jalalabad, then he in, went to India, conquered India. His name is Gandalfaris. He was, uh, he converted to Christianity in the first century AD by the invitation of St. Thomas, St. Thomas Act. It's, it's written in St. Thomas Act. So there was some, he called himself Varta Diva, the righteous one, the kind one. See, after he changed, he uh, converted to Christianity. During the Islamic era, we see all these beautiful uh, architecture, which were during the Ghaznavid period, in the paintings and also in the architecture, mostly uh, ultramarine blue was used. But during the Ghurid dynasty, they used a lot of turquoise, which made it beautiful. The same way, in the paintings of, of Behzad, we see the same colors were used. This is the, the, the one on the left is the dwelling dervishes of Chisht. Chisht is a place in south of Herat. Uh, and then that's where the, all the Naqshbandiya Sufis were living. And the other one is uh, the scene from the Bible, uh, Yusuf Zuleikha. And then also in illuminated pages by the poet Jami. And I took these pictures when I went to Herat showing the different usage of blue in the walls of the mosque of Herat. It's amazingly beautiful tile work. And then why they use these, okay, heavenly colors? Because the, color, the earthy colors represented the earth and the blue colors represented the, the heavens, the sky. So they wrote the holy verses of, of holy book on, on, on the white calligraphy on blue background. And this is, us, even in the synagogues that was in Afghanistan, you can see this same sort of architecture and same sort of design. This is an abandoned synagogue in the city of Herat that I visited in 2005 and took some pictures. And this is the shrine of, of um, a scholar, religious scholar, Abu Nas Parsa, uh, 15th century. It was created by the queen called Feruza Begum. And then you can see in the style work, the most beautiful usage of the ultramarine blue and also the earthly colors. And this is the shrine of Mazari Sharif, the, the fourth caliph. It was built by King Sultan Hussein by Khara in 15th century. It's amazing uh, uh, combination of the blues you see. It's, a, it's, it's just an amazing art piece, this whole building with so many domes and the white doves flying over it. And you see the same architect, but inside the 
Outside is more turquoise blue because it represents the sky, it attracts people. But inside it's like more serious. It gives another kind of feeling. It's mostly ultramarine blue. The same style of architecture went to uh, India during the Mongols two centuries later. And it is the, the, a corner from the tomb of, of Akbar. And this is from late 18, early 19th century, Afghanistan, which colors became less because the, uh, it was more like solid, solid, solid colors were used. It's a totally different style of architecture. It's octagonal based, but the tradition existed in Afghanistan and we see that the Afghan ladies still working on these beautiful designs and then they creating these beautiful artwork with different kinds of blue. That's the uh, Firuzko Institution, which is in the city of Kabul. And this is a painting I did in ultramarine blue long time ago, just in the memory of my teachers, Ustad Barishna and Ustad Umeid, who taught me how to mix the colors when I was a kid. And then you see the same colorful uh, co uh, designs in, 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 in the artifacts of Afghanistan. This is, a, this is from Kabul and Herat, the antique stores. And now the beautiful Afghan jewelry. I'm on time <laughs> and uh, I, I skipped a lot. I'm sorry, but there are, and, and then you can see by Miss Sima uh, the beautiful jewelry she made of lapis lazuli. Thank, Thank you. you so Finish. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. I'm not under pressure anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I will come, I will come. Don't worry. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. And my God, what an exciting and fascinating um, lecture, uh, Professor Nabi. Um, I thought I knew a lot about lapis, but I think I've learned a lot more tonight. Thank you, thank you. And, um, it was fascinating for me that it's so much um, lapis being worked in um, different cultures, different um, uh, ages. Um, and it is, I work with lapis as well, one of my best seller in British Museum, it is a lapis necklace. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is quite interesting that um, lots of people don't know, they like lapis, they come to shop and they say, wow, this is beautiful blue color. Mm -hmm. And we love it, and they buy it, and always lapis is a bestseller. Every, yes. Everything I do, yeah. but they don't know very much about lapis. They don't know where it comes from, um, and um, although it's been used a lot, as we heard you in your lectures, um, do you think you know you might be interested actually doing a book about lapis? Well, I uh, <laughs> right now I, yeah. I'm working on the second volume of my book in. Dari, Farsi. I, I finished the first two books. After this, maybe I can write something yeah. if, if, if you think it was interesting. I think it is because I, um, um, British Museum is one of the, uh, the biggest foothold in Europe. Yes. And, um, and they sell lapis so much. Yeah. And people like lapis, Europeans. And um, so I think it would be a need for it. I mean, I know in, in uh, 1970s yeah. there was a comeback because lots of Europeans were going into Afghanistan and India. So yeah. it was a little comeback of lapis. Mm. But um, I just well, yeah, yeah, because at this time I think we have to save our lapis. Yeah, because there are lots of smugglers who are just uh, taking the lapis in big quantities and they are uh, digging it unprofessionally. It's the national wealth of Afghanistan. It's not just commander's yes. thing. So I yeah. think uh, there should be like an uh, uh, Afghan government has to have some control and also uh, like international body to 
preserve this thing because it, it illuminated the whole world, not only Afghanistan. Right, yeah. it, it went to China, yeah. you know, during 14, 15th century. In the Farpanet city, the lots of usage of the lapis and also in the vases and beautiful ornaments of the ch China uh, <coughs> late, late uh, dynasties, you can see this beautiful artwork. Also in the yeah. Buddhist art of India, we see lots of lapis. Yeah, and it is. I mean, do you think that lapis, um, we have rarity in lapis? Or well, or is this it still mountain going? is still, you know, but anything you overuse sometime, someday yeah. will, will get. Yeah. Yeah. Because it has to have some control. You That's know. right. You have to have some control. That's right, yeah. Yeah, the people get greedy and get. Um, get to sell it a lot yeah. and the price will go down and then also the well already they, the prices are high I know again you know yes they're getting higher okay. um, I just want to allow um, you know that audience if you yeah. have any questions um, please raise your hand and the microphone will come to you uh, the gentleman on yeah. the third row please. hello um, thank you for that talk I was, I was thinking about um, simpler stones like red ochre and yellow ochre and cinnabar and chalk, things like that that have been ground down and used in cave art yes. by our uh, hunter-gatherer ancestors. Do you suppose that uh, lapis might have been used in the same way? Well, I don't know exactly how it is used, you know, um, but I, I knew that they were like mm, the painters of Herat, especially the painters of Herat, uh, they, they knew how to grind it and how to make these beautiful colors out of it. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Fekri Savjuki, an Afghan scholar, who wrote a book about this thing. And his son, Behzad Savjuki, he lives in Germany. He has all the, most of the formulas of all these ancient, ancient, um, or medieval time uh, techniques, how these colors and pigments were made, made. Because we know that paintings which were made by Mirak uh, and uh, Bezat's teacher, and um, they were created by, by all these uh, plants and different minerals. And when I was a kid, when my brother, I remember that Professor Burishna came to our, uh, was with my uncle, Omid. They were, I was very young. They, they were making a big painting for a stage. And then they asked me to put the blue paint, like powder, mm -hmm. on, on the milk. And they had a glue, a special glue. It was by boiling in water and they mixed it. Yes. And once they put it on the wall, it was amazing. So I, I learned some, some of them, but they were all synthetic paints, you know? Unfortunately, we did not dig so much on how these uh, ancient techniques were, uh, were created. Uh, that's all. Yeah. Uh, the, late, oh, the gentleman on the second row, please. It's, it's in, in, in the, in, on the mountains and the walls of the mountains, then they dig it, they will, they will go further, and they carry it out. I wish I brought the picture. I had the picture, but I thought maybe it's boring, that's why I took that picture out. And has it ever been taken medicinally? Sorry? Has it ever been taken medicinally? What do you mean? Well, you take it for medicine. To take oh, for medicine. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's very important. Is your phone? Okay. I don't, but we, we read an article that uh, Pamela sent me. Yes. That article was very nice. Yeah. And, uh, it was about, uh, they found in one of the German villages uh, the body of a skeleton of a woman, a nun, and then on, the, on her teeth, you could see like there's some lapis lazuli. It was like, like meant to be 
like a healing medicine. As it was, uh, I, I didn't put that slide because it, the teeth did not look so <laughs> inviting, you know. Uh, so because of all, all this beautiful artwork of, you know, like Perugino and Michelangelo, you don't want to put this teeth, you know. But you can see in that teeth that there's lapis lazuli. Yeah, and, and Afghanistan, we don't use it as a medical me medicine, yeah. but in Europe they have. Maybe they found something that we didn't know. Maybe ancient Mesopotamians also used it as, as, as a healing. Um, Do you know what it was used to heal? Yeah. We don't know, maybe they yeah. had some pains or something. Yeah. We have one more question over here. Yes, yes, I'm just curious if you could say any more about the Bamiyan cave. Oh I yes, I would love to do um, that. The earliest date I had heard was 640 AD, so I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about them. Okay, the word Bamiyan, oh, Bamiyan is in central Afghanistan. That was like the center of the trade route. In, in, in Kushan and era from 2nd to 5th century AD. That's why we have all these uh, influences of different artwork, you know, especially from Chinese mm -hmm. uh, pilgrims who came to Bamiyan. And also it had its own style, you know. So it was, see, from Chinese Turkestan, people were coming to mm -hmm. Balkh, and from Balkh, through the gorges of Hindu Kush mountain to Bamiyan. So they had to make lots of caves in, 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 in the cliff uh, for people to stay there because there was not any hotels those days, you know? So they made these holes and holes and holes which looked like, like, like a bee hole, you know? On, on the mountain, hundreds and hundreds of, of holes and then that all these people who are coming from foreign way distances from India, from China, from the cities of Afghanistan yeah. to stay there. And some of them were used for like study rooms <laughs> and then it was all decorated with uh, pictures, different episodes of Bam uh, Buddha's life. Uh, and then uh, some of them were like assembly rooms that you could uh, gather more monks and more people and they had, uh, yes. see, there is, um, and then there were lots of paintings of birds on the niches of these big arches of Bamiyan, uh, according to ha Hamawi, uh, Yaqut Hamawi, who was a traveler who came to Bamiyan in the 11th century, and then he, he said that he saw all the birds in the world painted in the walls of Bamiyan. And then uh, that's like these birds were paying uh, their, their respect to Buddha, because they were like symbol of peace. You know, Buddha wrote there, his ideas did not write, he just talked and talked. And his mm -hmm. apostles gathered it, yeah. and they put it in three books, which is called Tripatika, three baskets of flowers. All his thoughts were there. And most of these paintings yeah. Were, yeah. were created from Tripatika, yeah, mm, throwing puddles of flowers on Buddha. It's a, it's a very beautiful. And this is all done under the school of Mahayana. Mahayana was like the beggar wheel. According to the Mahayana, no, he passed away. His, uh, there were like some conviction, conventions that his followers came together. In the first convention, they gathered all his thoughts. In the second one, there was division. Because some of them were saying that we should not uh, create Buddha's paintings, pictures. That's school of Hinayana. It was limited. Yeah. It was small. And then uh, the other school was Mahayana, bigger. Yeah. So we do not only pray for ourselves, but for a bigger society. And because in that time, the, Indi the Brahmani religion believed in caste system, and Buddha wanted to make people elevate from this 
one level to another level, so there was so much pressure on the Buddhists until King Ashoka became the, yeah. uh, converted to Buddhism. Yeah. And then, uh, so, in the third convention, some people who were mostly younger, they, they took the skull of Buddha, ran away to Afghanistan. And that's when they first created the temple of Hadda in Jalalabad. Hadaka means skull in, 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 in Sanskrit. Haduke in Pashto. Hadda is the name of the temple where they kept the skull of Buddha. And that's when they started to create the statues. Uh, these statues were made in a Hellenistic style in terms of form, but not in terms of content. And then that's when the content of Buddhism combined with the art of Hellenistic, so that's why we have the Hellenistic <laughs> Buddhist art emerging from Afghanistan, from uh, Bamiyan, from uh, Hada, uh, from uh, Parwan, from Kapisa, all the way to Ghur. Yakavlan and all that. It's amazing. I, I'm just getting away from the subject again. No, I'm this sorry. This is very fascinating. Um, um, thank you sorry. very much. And uh, we have only uh, one more question. Um, it's, it's a lady on the back. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> no, since she asked me about the caves of Bamiya, I have. I know. <laughs> it's a fascinating story. Sorry. Um, just one question, actually, about the image. Um, on the screen and jewelry in general, was there a very strict hierarchy for who was allowed to wear lapis lazuli? Could it only be royal or could it be bought in the market? Or? No, well, you can answer that, <laughs> Sure. I mean, the blue in, in many, many um, centuries and many um, cultures, uh, it was a royalty color, even from China to Indus Valley and coming to even uh, Europe. Uh, but I don't think it, the lapis was one of those that only belonged to royalty, to wear those. Um, but it's the dark blue color in all the majority of the culture, it is a royalty blue, but not this specific one. <laughs> yeah. But usually these necklaces are grand for a wedding. Um, so they, for their big ceremonies, they do wear these, yeah. And um, in general, they believe that uh, this lapis is a uh, protects you. And uh, so lots of women did wear lapises, yeah. I hope this answers. Um, we have one more question. Is that, can we just quickly? I'd love to enjoy the conversation next yes. door. Uh, yes, we're going to, I, mean, I mean, we're going to have a, a, a drinks and a talk next door. And um, there is, we can maybe talk more one-to-one. Um, -one yeah. And, yes. um, sure. If you don't mind. But thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank, you. No, oh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.